So hello everyone. Uh, so thank you for the conference to letting me the opportunity to present this work. Um, so this work is about uh, uh, providing a methodology allowing to minimize the resource to uh, make large-scale quantum computer. Uh, so what I call a resource here can be very general. It's just something you want to minimize when you perform your computation. And in this talk, I will mainly uh, focus on energy and power to have large-scale quantum computers. And all the example to, to make an example will be based on superconducting qubits. So at the end of this talk, I would like to give some very rough idea of the amount of energy or power that we need to, for instance, crack RSA on a full tolerant superconducting qubit quantum computer. And I will also uh, try to give some element to see if we can have an energy advantage without a computational one. So what do I mean by that? We take a problem that can be both solved by a classical and a quantum computer, and we see how much energy the quantum computer will, it will cost for, for, for it. So the, the, the core of this, method, the, the, this work is based on methodology that we call MNR for metric noise resource. So I already explained the resource is the thing you want to minimize, but you need other things in your model. You need a, a precise model of the noise occurring at the physical level for your qubits. Uh, basically, for instance, uh, an open system uh, master equation. And you need another thing, which is the metric. It's the thing that quantifies how good your computation was. So the, the very simplest example is the fidelity of the output state of your algorithm. And you have control parameter in the middle. That's the thing that experimentalists can tune. And by tuning them, they can at the same time modify the resource, the noise, and the metric. So I directly take an example. Imagine that you want to minimize the energy to run a computation on a quantum computer. And you can tune the qubit temperature. Again, I'm considering superconducting qubits for the example. So basically, the colder your qubit will be, the more energy will spend. But it's good because you, have, you, you, you limit the amount of noise. And then you have a higher fidelity for your computation. So you see that the, the resource, the noise, and the metric are all connected with that. And then what we can ask is, OK, what is the minimum energy I need to run my computation? You just say, I want to reach that fidelity. For my, for my output state of my algorithm. And it will tell me how I should choose my temperature in order to reach that fidelity. And it will be a non-trivial value, not necessarily at 10 millikelvin, maybe at 40 millikelvin, maybe at 6 millikelvin, but to be sure that your algorithm succeeds, but you spend the least amount of energy to do it. So I will first give the example with the very simple pedagogic example, uh, just a single qubit gate, and then we will go to, to a more complete model of quantum computers. So on the bottom right, you will see that I will always specify the step in the modeling. So how do we do a single qubit gate? So typically in superconducting qubits, you have the qubit inside the cryogenics. You send microwave pulse through coaxial cable, and they interact with, with the, the qubit to make the, the gate. In practice, uh, what experimentalists typically put is that so you have the pulse, and then you have something called an attenuator. It's a big resistor that will basically dissipate a lot of your signal, so it makes loop Weird, why, why, do we, why do we put this? It's actually because the, the signal are generated typically at room temperature, and you have a lot of thermal noise there. So you don't want this noise to interact with your qubits. So by putting an attenuator here, you dissipate your signal, but also the noise that has been emitted at room temperature. And it allows you to have the qubit that is really thermalized at the temperature it is. So the first step is we specify the control parameter and the resource. Here we will optimize the level of attenuation and the temperature of the qubits. And for the power, we just take, for instance, uh, yeah, don't know. Okay. We just take uh, the, the a Carnot efficiency, and uh, we multiply by the heat that is dissipated by this attenuator. So that's the first step of the modeling. Then we need the noise model. For the noise model, we consider uh, basically a Hamiltonian evolution and an open system. And, uh, sorry, um, like you have a excitation and relaxation. And here we, we take a simple model where we have the spontaneous emission rates. And so basically we have two, two parameters. Um, you have the, 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 the number of thermal noise photon that will interact with your qubits. And you also have a spontaneous, spontaneous emission. Basically, if your qubit in an ideal world, if it was exactly at zero temperature, it's still noisy because of spontaneous emission. And the number of noisy photons uh, is basically depends on the temperature of your qubit and your level of attenuation because it's what limits the thermal noise. OK, so that's the, the, the noise part of the model. The metric, we consider the fidelity for a single qubit gate. So we can calculate it very easily. 
So it's, it's okay. And then I will show the, just the minimization after, but basically here, what, we, what I show here is the power consumption of our gate as a function of the attenuation we put on the line and the temperature of the qubit. So we see that naturally, if we attenuate a lot, it dissipates a lot of heat. And if we put the qubit temperature low, uh, it, uh, basically it costs a lot of power. And that's the opposite behavior on the upper left, high temperature qubit, low attenuation, few power dissipated. But for the metric, that's the op exactly opposite behavior. You would like to put your qubit very cold to attenuate a lot in order to limit the maximum the thermal noise. And you, so you have this competition between the, the resource you pay and the fidelity you want to reach. And then what you can ask is, OK, I want to reach that fidelity. For instance, so here, that's the white line here. Uh, for instance, th that's a fixed fidelity, this white line here. And basically, it gives you a constraint on attenuation to temperature to reach this given fidelity, and you find the minimum power consumption along that line. And it will tell you, this will be the minimum power you should spend to, to run your gate, and not only the minimum power, but also how to reach it. What is the level of attenuation you should put and the temperature of the qubits? So this is the very simple, actually, uh, to, to, to do it, but now, when it's not changing, it's do it to a complete model of quantum computer. So this is now what I will present. So this is the model of quantum computer we considered. So we discussed a lot with engineers to try to make a consistent model the best we could. Um, and so what do, what do we have inside? The first, so here, everything here is, a cryo, is, is inside the cryogenics. And basically, we have a first stage with all the electronics that are here to generate the signal, to digitize the signal for, from the readouts that come from the qubit. So all these electronics here. So why is it inside the cryogenics? So it is uh, basically the uh, electronics engineer thinks it's better for scalability for practical reason. I won't tell you the detail, but also in terms of energy efficiency. Why? Because if you put this inside of the cryogenics, basically you remove a lot of heat conduction coming from the lab, and then it might be more energy efficient. But it's not obvious because you also put electronics inside the cryogenics, and it's hard to evacuate all that heat, and it costs power. So it's it's not obvious that that it is, but in our, in our thing, that's the first stage we will optimize. We will optimize its temperature, the first controllable parameter. Then you have, uh, so for maybe why do we have that much uh, amount of stage? So the more stage you put in a cryogenics, to say things simply, the more energy efficient, and we took a typical number that you, you can have in experiment. So then you have uh, the part that will drive the qubit. So here you have coaxial cable, the same kind of thing I said before, with temperature and attenuation. We optimize the temperature and attenuation on each of these stages. You have the amplification stages. We won't optimize the temperature because then it's too complicated numerically. But basically, we, we model also the, the, the level of amplification you put inside and the heat it dissipates. And we have the physics of the superconducting qubits that we model. And uh, we also optimize the temperature and attenuation on that stage. OK. And then we are doing quantum error correction. So there is also quantum error correction in our model. So we use concatenated code. I will explain why, why this code just after. But basically, the very simple principle, when you, when you use concatenated code, you have a parameter, k, called the concatenation level. It gives you how much physical qubit per logical qubit you have. And, sorry. And, you, and so why do we want to increase this value of k? So here we have typically a 91 to the power k physical qubit per logical qubit. So we want to increase that because uh, basically, we can define the probability of error of a logical gate when we do uh, error correction. And it's related to the probability of error of a physical gate. Let's say it's roughly 1 minus the fidelity, the probability of error of your physical gate, roughly speaking. And um, you realize that if your physical error probability is lower than the threshold, by increasing the value of k, here you have something that is lower than 1, and you can make it go uh, be as close to 0 as what you would like. And so basically, by increasing the value of k, yes, you have more physical qubit per logical qubit, but also the, the, the quality of your gate at the logical level are better. So why did we use concatenated code? Because it's, uh, it's, code that are known to be, it's, it's code that are known to be expensive in the context of superconducting qubits, because, uh, so because the, basically, it's, it, it can induce large overhead compared, for instance, for surface code. So in our approach, we wanted to be able to quantify the full energy to run the computation. And in concatenated code, we can estimate everything analytically. And we can have access to the power to decode the syndrome for our correction, which in practice will be negligible compared to the other costs of signal generation, etc. 
We surface code, which is a, a most popular approach. Uh, it, it has a much higher threshold, but the problem of decoding the syndrome, it's still an, an open question in the field. Can we decode the syndrome fast enough uh, to keep track of the, fl the, the, the flux of data from error correction? And we were not, uh, we, given the information in the literature, it's very hard to know how much it will cost. And it might be a significant cost, and we did not want to neglect the elephant in the room. So that's why we, we have chosen that. So, uh, what we will, so then you have this model, okay, you can express the power consumption as a function of all the parameters I said, the level of concatenation, the, the temperature, etc. And, uh, and so that's the control parameter already specifies and, and okay, the, the resource is specified. For the noise, we take the same noise model as before. I won't enter in the, in the detail. And for the metric, we use the knowledge from error correction that is able to tell us how, what is the probability that the logical gate fails. And from that, we can infer the probability that the algorithm fails. And we reach, we want a typical value, two thirds. That's typically what is considered uh, when, when, when you want to, to, to do error correction, that's a standard value. And so the metric is specified. And we are now, now ready to perform the minimization. So, just before, what I would like to say is that, of course, this estimation has to be taken with a pinch of salt because it's, it's very challenging to make a, a full model. So what matters is first the very rough order of magnitude to see. And also keep in mind that we assume, we make some assumption about technological improvements. In particular, there is one thing that we are forced to do to assume very high quality qubits. So the qubit lifetime in our model is 50 milliseconds. It's two order of magnitude better than the state of the art uh, entrenchment qubits. So it's very optimistic, but we are forced to do it because we use concatenated code. And we use concatenated code because we wanted to not neglect the, the to, to have a model that tries to encompass everything. So that's a necessity. Then we are doing some a bit optimistic assumption about the electronics, but really the qubit lifetime is by far the, the most optimistic we do. Uh, basically, we assume that they, they can be reduced by another magnitude compared to today's state of the art, roughly speaking. So this we discussed with the electronics engineer that told us, okay, it's reasonable that in the next years, we might be able to gain a little bit. So that's what motivated us. And for the, this big cryostat, we consider a Carnot efficiency. It might look very optimistic, but actually it's not, because for instance, if you consider the CERN the, the, uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Geneva, uh, all the cryogenics is very close to Carnot efficiency. It's a fraction of Carnot efficiency. It is not what we have today in experiments, uh, in, in small scale experiments uh, in the experimental world, but it's because this is, those are not optimized to, with the, the, this is not optimized to evacuate large amount of heat. So we need to take what we think is the good thing for large scale, which is kernel efficiency. And finally, so I will show the results. So we will plot the result as a function of the number of logical qubits, the power consumption, and the number of time step of the algorithm, which is called the def. So this is the, 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 the power consumption to break, so as a function of the number of logical qubits and the number of logical time steps, so the def of the algorithm, um, how much it will cost with assuming qubit lifetime of 50 milliseconds uh, to run a full tolerant algorithm. So what we see here, for instance, is here it is RSA 2000. So to break RSA 2000 with our model, it tells us that it will cost 7 megawatt for a few hours. So, um, and then we have other value for other, yeah, for other key, key size. And, uh, Basically, we see those brutal change of color. They are the moment where our optimization tells us if you want to save power, that's at this precise moment, you should add physical qubit per logical qubit in your computer. So it, it increases the power consumption. But actually, if you zoom, everything is smooth. It's just that the transition is, 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 uh, is quick. So one thing that I think is very interesting, um, what is the difference between how much you spend power in classical and quantum computing? In classical computing, Let's say you have a supercomputer, you want to run an algorithm for one hour and you want to run an algorithm for 10 hours. The power consumption of your, of your supercomputer, even if you try to optimize everything, will be roughly constant. In quantum computing, it will be very different. The power consumption will increase with the duration of the algorithm. Why? Because you want to limit the noise. The longer the algorithm is, the more you have to reduce the noise. So first, of course, you have to do more error correction. Uh, people familiar will, will, with error correction will not be surprised by that, but also, because you need to keep your temperature colder the longer the algorithm is, you need to attenuate more. So everything will make that the power consumption will grow with the algorithm duration. And on the right, so, okay, so 
what is happening? Because it's not just an, esti uh, an estimation, we take value and we fix them, it's a, a minimization. So on the right, we have the temperature of the qubits to understand what's happening. So let's look at that point where basically here we just did an extra level of error correction and look at the behavior of the temperature. Here, what the script tells us is you want to minimize your power, you just did an additional level of concatenation, you just did more error correction, there is no need to maintain your qubit at 10 millikelvin. You can put it at, at high temperature because then you will save power. And then the longer the algorithm is, then the colder you should put your qubit because you need to resist against the noise until a moment here, they are at 4 millikelvin. The, the, the simulation tell, tells you, okay, you want to minimize your power consumption. If you go below 4 millikelvin, you will, you, you will spend more power than if you add physical qubit per logical qubit. So it's at this exact moment that you should add qu uh, quantum error correction, an extra layer. And then because you did this, the script says, you, okay, now you do more error correction, so put your qubit at higher temperature. There is no need to maintain them cold if you want to save power. And so that's, that's, the, yeah, that's the, the behavior we see here. So qualitatively, this will occur for any kind of quantum computer uh, model based on any kind of technology, this qualitative behavior. Uh, basically, it's, at, it's a really completely multidisciplinary effect because it's induced by the physics of the superconducting qubits. Uh, why, why the qubits are um, so? Why the, why the qubits are at such low temperature? Uh, it's because uh, it's because of the noise model. The way we implement the algorithm, because the longer the, the, the longer the computation is, uh, the colder the the qubit must be. The the quantum error correction it gives us the two edge on the temperature variation, and of course the aspect of quantum, the cryogenics and engineering because that's the power consumption. Uh, and in some examples, not this one actually, but we, we see that uh, the optimization can reduce really significantly the, the bill from sometimes 10 megawatt to a few megawatts. So why is that? Uh, so for instance, uh, one, one example is this thing, sometimes it might look counterintuitive, but it's better to have more physical qubit per logical qubit because then it allows you to maintain your qubit at higher temperature. And this, you cannot see it if you reason in an isolated manner without connecting everything. Finally, last thing I will talk about, we try to compare the energy efficiency to classical computers. So for this, we took the best classical algorithm that exists to break RSA, which is JNFS algorithm. It has been broken uh, for RSA 830, and we compare the energy on a quantum computer and a classical computer. So with our model, for instance, it will spend less, 100 times less energy than the classical computer. Again, based on optimistic assumption on things, so I'm not hiding it, but it's just to try to, to see how we could define this energy advantage. And the thing is that both calculations are tractable on the quantum and the classical, so maybe it could be interesting to, 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 to build quantum computer, not because of a computational advantage, but of energy one. Because it's easier to build small scale quantum computer that are not able to reach the computational advantage, that, but that maybe brings an energy advantage. So take home message. Basically, it's important to connect the metric, the noise, and the resource, because then you can really save a lot of things if you understand those connections. And it allows, and basically, the optimal of the quantum computer is intrinsically connected to all the fields that are inside the quantum computer. You, reasoning in an isolated manner does not lead to an energy efficient design. Uh, okay, so this uh, I just said uh, before. Uh, no, so maybe, uh, so this work uh, is, um, is basically related to the quantum energy initiative. So it's one of the seeds behind the quantum energy initiative. So you can look on the perspective written by my uh, former PhD advisor, Alexey Ofev. And so finally, yeah. Uh, so the, this work should be on archive by the end of September. And those in the red box are the people that really participated uh, in this work. And here, all the people would like to thank for their collaboration, uh, for advices I gave in particular, Olivier Drati, which was, uh, gave us a lot of advice. And finally, uh, this is the preliminary, preliminary work that led us to this study, which is on Perix quantum, but it's not this study in particular. Thank you.